So I'll start now. Okay. Um, so what I what I, I have here a short presentation about why digital preservation is so difficult. You know, there's a lot of work gone on to preserve digital objects. What, why is that? So, so what's special about digital as opposed to, say, documents, papers, and so forth? Well, of course, one, one might say, well, you know, you've got these little ones and zeros, and, and you always need some machine or something to, to, to look at them. Otherwise, you, you can't see them. Whereas a piece of paper or an object, you, you can just read it. Well, but of course, you, you, can, you can actually see some, some of the things. This is um, um, a close-up of... Uh, a, a stamped, a pressed uh, CD. And what you can see are the little holes, the little pits in the CD. And so you might say, well, you know, you can see this. You need a magnifying glass, but it, it shows you something. Although, well, the story is a little bit more complicated than that because if I look at that, I need to unravel various um, levels of detail from the physical to the bits, which are, which are in a sense uh, at a logical level. Because if you, uh, if you look into these things, you might need um, uh, what's called bit stuffing, um, although that's normally for network uh, transmission. Uh, you have error correction codes. Um, you have uh, the issues of logical addressing. You've got the organization of the material on the disk. And all of those things you need to know about. Now, all of those things are documented. And um, as you'll see later on, what I would refer to those things are as representation information. In other words, I could have the, all of the, the pits on the, on the CD, but it's, it's not the bits. It, it, I have all of the, uh, the pits on the CD, but it's not the bits. And what I need is representation information to take it into the digital world. But uh, even there, it's a little bit, um, that's not the complete story. Because, okay, I, I can do something else. I, can, I know very well that uh, if I carve things in stone, then they can last for thousands of years. So I could, although it would take a lot of stone, I could carve, carve ones and zeros into stone. That's perfectly visible, last for a thousand years. That would be great. So... But, of course, people don't really want to do that. On the other hand, people have, quite seriously, written very on, onto um, titanium sheets or other very uh, long, long-lived material, uh, very small characters that can be read, actually, with the naked eye. Um, and um, they've, they've demonstrated, they've put it in, baked these things in ovens, they've sandblasted them, and it, it does survive. Um, and, but there's still something uh, missing about, uh, about this when we talk about um, these digital objects. Uh, and that is, it's difficult to, to, uh, to, to encompass in the bits themselves what they mean. You need more information. And this is what is often called metadata, although that um, I was reading um, one of these, uh, it was Semantic Webs for, Web for Dummies. And there was a quote there saying that essentially metadata is, doesn't really mean anything because it covers such a broad range of, of materials. So, we, uh, so what, our, what I'll introduce in this talk uh, is, is some alternative, a little bit uh, rather more precise terminology. So the sorts of materials that we're looking at in CASPAR are, of course, documents. Um, there are pieces of scientific data. There's an image uh, um, of, I think, the sun. We've got uh, data from detectors from uh, high energy physics. We've got uh, pictures of the Earth. We've got uh, uh, data at the, uh, at the molecular level. Um, and also we have uh, material from uh, uh, cultural heritage uh, and um, contemporary performing arts. So there's a very wide range uh, of, of disciplines there, uh, which we've chosen specifically to, uh, to test what we're doing. And each of these things 
is encoded digitally, but we, uh, we need more than just those bits and more than just knowing that it's a, a word file in order to understand it and to preserve it. And so here are some other examples of the sorts of data that we have and the whole collection of really very complex uh, materials that need to be uh, preserved. And, and another one where it's, we don't really want to talk about um, just an image. We want to be able, because each of the pixels in that image actually has many, many data values, and one wants to understand it well enough to process it and produce. So this is not just doing a false color uh, rendering of the image. It's actually generating uh, different scientific views of the data. So this, uh, by combining data at uh, different uh, uh, wavelengths, uh, is showing um, uh, chlorophyll concentrations in that area of land. Uh, so um, many of the uh, projects in digital preservation talk about really just formats. They, they talk about uh, Word and PDF and how can we preserve those. Um, and indeed that, that is a problem, but um, there are tools, for example, Jehovah, that uh, where you can uh, discover what, what a format of uh, some digital object is. Uh, and indeed there are Unix tools like the file command which will do the same sort of thing. Um, so if I have a file, it tells me it's Word, so I can use the Word um, uh, application to see what's in that Word file and I get this coming up on my screen. Have I, do I understand it? Have I really preserved it if all I can tell you is that it's Word? In fact, I need to tell you something else, namely that um, this, this has a, a, a slight encoding and it's just a simple um, uh, alphabetical um, uh, transcription um, and that's the actual message that's in, the, in that Word file. So I need to tell you not only is it a Word file, but also uh, what the uh, semantics involved is. Now that's something which one tends not to think about for documents, but um, it's, it becomes very clear that for, for data, for scientific data, it, it's something we absolutely need to have. Uh, and here's uh, uh, another way of looking at that for scientific, uh, this uh, scientific satellite data. We have ones and zeros, of course. Uh, if you um, add a certain amount of semantics, you can see that it's actually a, a table of numbers with, um, in different columns. But then you need to know what latitude, what, what coordinate system, what are the, uh, what are the units. Is it uh, radians? Is it hours, minutes, seconds? Um, is it degrees? Uh, the ozone, well, I think I know what ozone is, but what are the units? How is it measured? Uh, the time, uh, which time system is it? Is it uh, American East Coast time? Is it universal time? Uh, is it satellite time? Um, uh, have, have I, does it take into account uh, leap seconds properly? So all of those questions can be asked about this and all of them do need to be answered in order to go to the next step which is to process the data in order to uh, derive some scientific value out of it and maybe to combine it with other uh, pieces of scientific data. Um, but there are other aspects, so there, there are legal aspects associated with any piece of data. Here's something that uh, there's a separate presentation about of uh, concerning uh, digital rights management uh, where we can, um, where we have within CASPAR uh, done some research to allow us to uh, do something useful about understanding and preserving digital rights over time. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit now about some of the threats to digital, to, to the preservation of digital objects. So um, uh, in, in some ways, uh, digital preservation is quite easy because um, it's done all the time, at least over short time scales. And, and what's needed is, is simply money. 
So you just need a, a lot of money for a long time. And if you have that, then it's easy because you've got people who are constantly looking after things. And that happens for some projects. They have a lot of money but, um, for a certain period. But the one thing you'd be fairly sure of is that they won't have a lot of money forever. And so this is our task, how to uh, survive uh, how, how to keep the uh, digital objects useful when it goes through a period when there isn't a lot of money to, to support it, when there isn't a big team looking after it. There is, a, another, there is a disincentive though, and that is if you think about any organization, and this also has to do with money, their budget tends to be like this. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, sometimes it vanishes. But for digital preservation, even just sometimes you could argue that just the storage kind of goes like this. And because you're, you're, you're constantly accumulating digital objects, you need to keep doing work. It's a continuing effort. And the unfortunate uh, thing is that this might happen. And what that's saying is all your money has been used to preserve the material that you've generated and, so, and you have nothing left to do any new work. And if um, the people in charge of organizations think that this is going to happen, the response will be that we do not preserve those objects. So there are many threats revolving around the financial aspects that uh, digital objects have to uh, survive. Um, and so what we are trying to do in CASPAR is to provide uh, tools and techniques that make it practical to survive, but without involving huge amounts of money, uh, essentially allowing people to share the effort. And I think a number of other presentations that, that are available uh, show the various components that we've generated to, uh, to help to do that, to share the effort. But also you need to know exactly what, what to do. And so the examples that we have in the presentations uh, and videos show that also and give some real life examples of that. It's often said that um, we preserve things for future generations, uh, but uh, while that's very good, it is, uh, it is uh, true to say that future generations have two very great um, uh, drawbacks, and that is... Um, they don't vote and they don't pay taxes and therefore any time that money comes again, up against you know we must must preserve this these this material for future generations then I think it's fair to say that the future generations will lose out um, so we have to have another reason for preserving things and I, I think that a strong case can be made that Digital preservation is very closely tied to reuse of the digital objects that we have. And this is especially true for the scientific, the, the commercial sort of data that, that we have, uh, it, where essentially by combining um, uh, uh, scientific data from different, uh, different disciplines, we, we gain real benefits. We, we can find out about uh, global warming, we can uh, uh, create new products, we can, um, we, we can essentially enhance the economies of, of our countries. If we, not, not, not purely because of digital preservation, but because we preserve the ability to use and understand the material we have. And of course, that's not to forget the, the cultural heritage and the performing arts, because that's, of course, a, a benefit to, to humanity. But that also runs into the, the arguments about uh, saying it's for future generations. But the same sort of arguments about reuse of, of data can be made for, uh, for those, uh, those areas. But it's most clearly uh, understandable in terms of uh, scientific and commercial uh, digital information. So um, another way of saying this is digital preservation is easy as long as you provide money forever, uh, but also it's easy to test claims about repositories because many repositories, many 
many projects, many uh, uh, systems will say, w give us your data, we'll look after it. Um, but how do you test it? Because, of course, the real test is in a number of years' time when you or, or the, the people who've generated the data um, may not be around. So the only real way to test it is to be around for a long time. Um, but that also is not a terribly practical way to do things. So what we've uh, tried to uh, do within the CASPER project is to adopt a, uh, uh, the approach of the OEIS, Open Archival Information System Reference Model, which provides a very fundamental view of preservation which, which revolves around testability. OEIS looks at data in a very general way. Uh, the key concepts are that we need to be able to, uh, to test it. So we can test bit preservation in a sense. We can say whether the bits have been unchanged. I think that's a reasonable thing to be able to do. But we can't make uh, understandability. So I've argued earlier that it's not just the bits. We need to understand things. How do we, how do we make that testable? So OAIS introduces uh, tests about uh, uh, usability of data, which brings in the concepts, and there's another more detailed uh, presentation about OAIS. So I'll just touch on this briefly. It brings in the concepts of representation information, uh, designated community, the knowledge base of the designated community. All of these things will will be uh, brought out in more detail in the other videos that we have. Um, and the important thing to say is that all of these things that we talk about could be encompassed in the term metadata, but we need to be much more precise about uh, what we're talking. Otherwise, we can't say, are we missing um, this piece of information? Are we missing some metadata? It's hard to, to, to answer that. Whereas if you, if you say, are we missing some representation information, then you can be more precise. Uh, so representation information, uh, this is the diagram from OAIS. <coughs> representation information is what you need to add to the bits in order to make it understandable. And the key point is that representation information is itself maybe encoded digitally. And so it itself goes through this same process and so one needs the um, one needs representation information of representation information um, so for example if I have a FITS file I can give you the FITS standard FITS is a, an astronomical data format that's used but in fact if I just give you that then you still are not in a you might be able to display the information from the FITS file but you really don't understand it. You, you, um, and in fact, just going back a step, if I give you the FIT standard as a PDF file, and PDF is no longer used, then I will need to tell you something about PDF, or more likely I'll need to give you some PDF software. But in fact, I don't really want to go back to the standard and write my own software. What I'd like to do is to have some software that, that, that deals with FITS. Um, but that, that might be Java software, and in future, maybe Java will not be around, and therefore I'll need to tell you something about the Java virtual machine. But even if I've got all of these things, I still don't, can't really extract information from the FITS file, because FITS, the, the FITS standard maybe defines um, a few dozen keywords. A typical FITS file from an observatory has many hundreds of, of keywords that tell you what, how the data was taken, uh, where it was taken, when it was taken. And so I need a dictionary. That dictionary might be written in XML. Well, OK, maybe that's fine now. But I need to know the, the specification, and I might need to know about XML in future. So all of these things are things that I either need to know now, so I certainly need the FIT standard or the FIT software and the FIT dictionary, but in future I might need more of these things. 
And the way OAIS talks about this is that the, the knowledge base of the designated community might change. So, in other words, if, if, uh, if Java is no longer available, then my knowledge base, in a sense, needs to be supplemented by information, representation information about the Java virtual machine, and so forth. So again, there are other videos that, uh, and other uh, training material that talks about that in more detail. Let me go on to describe very briefly uh, the Caspar um, approach here. We, we look at digital preservation as involving um, creating many levels of information about the uh, data. So we have to uh, look at access control. Uh, we have to uh, capture some things about the, uh, the knowledge that's, uh, the semantics that's embedded in the information. We need to, uh, to look at how it's uh, laid out in the digital object. Uh, we need a number of other things. We need to store the data. And then when it's used in future, we need to essentially go up the other side of that uh, arrow. And there we will have our metadata at all these different levels. But in the future, the way that we've encoded this metadata uh, needs itself to be explained. And so at each level, we need, we've, we've created um, um, elements that themselves need to be preserved. So what this uh, says to us is that in order to preserve a digital object, you have to have a technique that can preserve just about any digital object. Because to preserve a digital object, you need to be able to preserve the digital rights that go along with it. You need to preserve the semantic information that goes along with it. You need to preserve the, uh, the descriptions of the, of the structure that goes along with it. And so it's quite a complex story. That, and we need to, in a way, jump in to all of these things in order to do anything. And that's, uh, that was the challenge that Caspar set itself. Um, and in the course of the videos that we have, the training materials, uh, I hope that we uh, illustrate all of these points. And I was talking about representation information before. This is the area where representation information lies for this particular object. So the uh, thinking, forgetting about money for the moment, the other things that we have to guard against are, of course, changes in, in software people know about. You know, will Word be around in five years' time? Will PDF be around? Uh, changes in hardware, that's sometimes uh, significant, and I think you'll see some examples of that in the uh, um, performing arts test beds. Changes in environment, there's a lot of interconnection, uh, especially uh, because we rely on things that are available uh, through, the, through the Internet. So we rely on being able to uh, uh, get uh, data given a URL, but in fact we know from studies that uh, URLs become unusable, uh, a large fraction of them become unusable after quite a short time. We rely on the domain name service, but in fact uh, quite a number, a surprising number of the uh, most significant names that we use are owned by individuals. And so we, it's not clear how those domain names will be passed on, how they can be uh, maintained. And, of course, the other thing that changes is our, our people. So just the, the things that people tend to know. So that, that was the, the knowledge base that I touched on uh, before. So we need to be able to uh, withstand all of those sorts of changes. And, and these are quite uh, difficult things to do. And I'll just talk a little bit more about some of the threats and how they are perceived um, by the community that's out there. And what I'll report on is a, is a survey that, as we speak, is just being finalized by the PARS Insight project. Uh, there will be some more materials that um, 
the CASPER training website will point to uh, as that is updated. But I'll give you uh, the flavor of what's, uh, what's been uh, uh, found from these surveys and the URL is there at the bottom of the slide where additional material will be published. So we, within PARS Insight, we looked at a number of different sorts of people, con stakeholders concerned with digital preservation and asked uh, some quite broad questions. But we, for all of these different uh, stakeholders, we asked some common questions about threats. Um, and we've received in PARS Insight a lot of responses. So I'm not going to go through uh, these, these numbers. These, uh, these will be updated by the PARS Insight project. But the threats that we uh, looked at were, uh, I'll have another slide about. What I wanted to point out was that if you look at the percentages, the people, the majority, thought that all of these threats were either important or very important. When the survey was set out, we designed this to have five options, to, in, in a sense to tempt people to choose the middle one because it says slightly important. So if people didn't really know or care, they could tick the middle box and what we expected to see was a big um, majority of people ticking the middle box if they didn't really have any strong feelings. In fact, what the numbers show and what the final results uh, show is that the majority of people think that all of these threats are either important or very important. So let's just look at those threats. Um, so the first one, users may be unable to understand or use the data. So what I have on, what I'm going to show on the other side are uh, some of the things which relate to the CASPER solutions and there'll be training materials about each of these uh, uh, in the uh, set of training materials that CASPER has produced. So of course being able to not, to be unable to understand or use the data, well what we would say is we need representation information and we need to maintain that representation information. So, um, so what we're doing fits in and addresses that threat. Uh, the non-maintainability of hardware, I think that we have, um, what we say about that within Caspar is that we um, essentially have things like emulators, we have replacements uh, in, in software terms, we can rebuild systems, and we have some examples of that. The alternative would be to, uh, to keep a museum of, of old hardware. And there are some of those around, but it does become very difficult to maintain that over time. Uh, the lack of evidence uh, could be lost. That is a concern for people. It's certainly a concern for the um, uh, state archives and for uh, commercial companies that have legal obligations. What we're doing for that is to uh, allow a coherent way of bringing together information uh, that is evidence for preservation. So this is tied in with what OAIS and other projects say about the fundamentals of authenticity. Um, but uh, we have a number of tools and there's a separate video uh, that uh, uh, talks about authenticity um, and so I think that what we're doing addresses uh, a good part of that concern. Um, access restrictions uh, may, be, may make it difficult to reuse data or it, they may not be uh, respected be um, in future. So things may become difficult to reuse if you're not sure what, what the rights are. So I think that um, the way that we've been dealing with uh, digital rights management, again, a separate video, I'm not going to say anything about it here, but 
while we don't have all the answers, we have made a good start on how to address that need. The ability to identify data, we've done some work on that, not enough. I think there are um, a number of areas that need further investigation. Concern that the current custodian of the data uh, may cease to exist in the future. Um, I think that we, we have done a little bit about that, and you'll hear something about the, uh, the, um, the orchestration management, which could allow uh, organizations to, uh, to uh, could allow a brokering between organizations for handing on uh, digitally encoded information that they can no longer uh, maintain. And finally, the threat about um, trustability. So in other words, we might trust our data to somebody, some, some, some archive, and uh, they may let us down. They may not really preserve the, the information. They may preserve the bits, but not the information. So uh, what we've been working in CASPAR is, is uh, with the group that is um, producing uh, at, uh, as I speak, they produced a draft of the standard that's going into uh, the International Standards Organization and hopefully against that a process for certifying archives will be built. And we've been working very closely with that group. So in all of these major threats that uh, the majority of people in a very wide survey, worldwide, a very wide survey, multiple stakeholders, uh, they've all agreed that these are really either very important or important threats, then we can say uh, fairly confidently that we've uh, done a, a, a good amount to address all of them.